Welcome to episode 166 of the Alcohol Addiction Podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I am not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone who doesn't drink alcohol. I spend every waking moment of my life helping other people do the same. Apologies. Uh, I haven't been online doing a, a video like this, um, a podcast like this, for quite some time now. To be honest with you, been absolutely chock-a-block. Um, been trying to get... I, if you don't know, um, my name is Lee. I live and I've grown up in my entire life in the UK and I'm married to Liza who spent her entire life in Los Angeles, America and uh, Britain, very, well, Britain's not a country, America and Wales, very similar countries, but when you fall in love with each other and you want to live with each other in one of those countries, it becomes very complicated. So for the last couple of weeks, we've been trying to get uh, Liza's third visa uh, this time it is an indefinite leave to remain, which means that Liza can now stay in the UK uh, as long as she doesn't spend two years outside of the UK, in which case they will rescind her visa. So that's good news. Uh, means that we don't have to spend another £3,000 um, going through this bureau bureaucratic, nonsensical process. Like, I know that the process is supposed to be there for a reason, to stop you know, people who come into your country to do no good, but I don't know, the, the whole thing is just absolutely ball aching. I mean, and the test, the living in the UK test is ridiculous. I mean, the amount of times I tried it and failed and I lived here my entire life. Uh, fortunately, life lighter past first time. But I will give you this piece of advice and it's the advice that the government give to idiots like me. Never ever book your flights before you've got your visa. OK, we did it to try to get cheap flights, cheaper flights to L.A. And we ended up getting the visa the day before we traveled. And I got to be honest. I suffered from severe uh, levels of stress and anxiety. As a result of that, really ought to do with money, you know, if you think about it, because if the visa hadn't turned up in time, we would just would have lost our flights and have had to buy new ones. Um, so I was just worried about that all the time. But at the moment that I had Liza's uh, visa in my hand, I realised that all that stress and anxiety that I had created myself through my own thought process, okay, did nothing, absolutely contributed nothing but pain and heartache towards the process of getting the visa. No part of that stress anxiety added any value whatsoever to the process. I can't even argue that it created a sense of urgency because I had no control over when they were going to give me the visa. All right. And it showed me in that moment what an idiot I had been. Not an idiot, actually. How human I had been by manufacturing my own disaster, my own pain, my own suffering, my own physical discomfort, my own mental discomfort, when really I could have just said to myself all zen-like and spoken to the quantum field, as Joe Dispenza says, and said, hey, it's going to be okay. I will get the visa when I need the visa. And if I don't, I will be able to deal with that when it happens. And I'm just going to get on with my life and not worry about it. And if I would have taken that approach, all right, I would have got the same outcome, except it would have been a better one because I wouldn't have been subjected every cell in my body to an attack of stress and anxiety. And I'm mentioning this because the same thing happens when it comes to drinking alcohol. Many of us drink alcohol to deal with the stresses and anxieties of our lives but invariably, we are creating 100% of that stress and that anxiety. So we need to think to ourselves about how we can do things differently. How we can learn to experience uh, the suffering. How we can learn to incorporate new mindfulness practices, meditation. Um, just learning to just relax and not worry about things that aren't in our control. And if we can... If we can do that, then the likelihood of us turning to alcohol as a way of dealing with our stress and anxiety um, is going to be much reduced. 
we wouldn't need it, would we? We wouldn't need it. And anyway, alcohol doesn't do anything except, if you think about it, if I would have drunk alcohol to try to quell the stress and anxiety while I waited for my visa, not only would I have been subjecting myself with a barrage of stress and anxiety, which I no doubt put out there into the world, especially in my interpersonal relationships, but I also would have been suffering the shame and the guilt of drinking, include, including all the terrible effects that drinking a poison has with your body, right? So as you, it never, ever helps to have a drink in that spot. You think that the answer to reducing the stress and anxiety is to have a drink, when really the answer to reducing stress and anxiety is focusing on the truth that we are creating the stress and anxiety. And because we are choosing to create it, we can also make the choice to uncreate it, okay? And what I love about the truth about alcohol and strive uh, so much is that we talk about these things and we share these things and we air these things and we philosophize about these things. Uh, and, and that opens up a whole new window of opportunity, um, taps into a whole new um, wealth and breadth of human potential that has probably laid dormant uh, for many, many, many years. Uh, for me, probably since I was a teenager. So there you are, little waffle. I'm in Los Angeles at the moment. Yay! I'm here until April the 1st. Feeling pretty good about it, I've got to be honest. We're staying with Liza's parents and her mum and Zia just bonded straight away. And Liza gets a lot more support when her mum's here, right? The, like the, the whole lot of them have gone out now to the park or whatever. And because she gets that support, it allows me to crack on and work, which is something that I really like doing. <laughs> so I could do more podcasts, I can do more writing, I can spend more time on striving. And it's a busy time, so everybody's very happy here, okay? First of all, before I go on to the main podcast, I want to say congratulations. <coughs> Get a cough out of the way. Congratulations to Julian. Julian has uh, gone 200 days uh, with being someone who doesn't drink alcohol. And that coincided with 30 days consecutively checking in on the Strive uh, Forum. Uh, so for that, Julian... I'm going to send you a little gift to your home uh, via the post all the way from LA. And I hope you like it. Uh, well done, Julian. You are a integral member of the movement. We love having you around. Look, let's be honest here, right? Like thinking about drinking alcohol and trying to run away from it, getting three of the shackles of it, um try not to drink it, it could be a pretty morose, miserable, moany, groany kind of fucking life, can't it? And what you bring to the table, Julian, is a lot of comedic value. Yeah, I love reading your check-ins. I love reading your homework in the intensive. I, I don't know. I think you just bring a, a freshness and a, and a much-needed light uh, to what can be a pretty sombre topic. So thank you for that. Also, I want to say congratulations to Bonnie, Sue, Susan, Candice and Ruth. Uh, those one, two, three, four, five lovely ladies have just finished the December, ah, the November taster. Uh, so congratulations to all of you for, for that. It was fantastic working with you. Um, I know you left it in a much better place than when you started it. And super duper congratulations to Sue and Ruth who are going to lengthen their experience, deepen their philosophy about the truth about alcohol. Uh, they're currently taking the intensive. I also want to say a wonderful well done to Michelle, Clint and Adrian. Uh, Michelle, Clint and Adrian have just finished the final ever life-changing experience and they will now move over and finish um, the Freedom module, which is our brand new module over in the intensive. So well done, folks. It's been a, an absolute pleasure, honestly. Um, you know, you were the ninth group. And I, I've got to say, you were one of the best. I really enjoyed working with you. So thanks for that. And finally, welcome to Mark, Phil, Helen, Elsa, Rhonda and Kleiss to the December Taster. Um, December's not an easy month. It's not an easy month. Um, it is the month where probably we drink more alcohol than any other month as a species. So choosing to actually 
go through the taste for not drink for the 31 days of December or however days there are in December. Um, I, I think that shows a real boldness, a courage and a willingness to get over this, um, you know, this addiction. So thank you for that. If you want to get involved with the Strive Movement or the Taster or the Intensive, get over to www.thetruthaboutalcohol.co.uk and uh, you can join any one of them. Uh, the Taster is 20, it's a private little group over in Strive where we take the vow not to drink for a month. Uh, there will be 28 consecutive assignments, uh, group peer learning, uh, some homework there, coaching videos, that kind of thing. And then if you take the intensive, it's an annual subscription to uh, Strive where we work through over 100 uh, coaching videos and assignments and um, go through the modules of truth, uh, awareness and freedom. It's an absolutely fantastic experience. People love it. So if you want to get involved in that, go to www.truthbyalcohol.co.uk. Now, I'm going to talk about can you drink moderately? It's a question that Felix asked when Felix joined the email list of the Strive movement. I haven't seen Felix in the Strive itself yet, um, but Felix is getting my emails and I assume that Felix is listening to this. So I'm going to do my best to um, answer this question from my own personal experience and share in my own personal view, Felix. So the question, can you drink moderately? Well, obviously, the answer is yes. Because we all know people, don't we, who drink moderately. All right. Now, moderate, though, you know, what is the measure of drinking moderately? And I think this measure of how we drink moderately will vary depending on our environment and our culture. You could say that the the health guidelines created and produced by our own health services in our own countries on how many alcoholic units a week you should drink. I think in the UK, it's something like 14 units or something. You could use that as a metric, right? You could say, well, if I'm only drinking 14 units a week and that's what my um, government and the healthcare are telling me uh, I should be drinking, then I'm drinking moderately. You know, you could argue if I'm drinking less than 14 units, I'm drinking moderately. And if I drink over 14 units, I'm... I'm going into a different kind of uh, realm altogether. But if you grew up in Ogmore Valley, where I grew up, an old mining town where everybody absolutely canes this stuff down your neck like nobody's business, then somebody who is perceived to be a moderate drinker could also be described in the horrific term that we don't like to use here of an alcoholic. Okay. Let me say the reason I don't like to use the term alcoholic is because I personally believe that the term alcoholic is part of the wider system of alcoholism, which, as you know, is an invisible, violent and dominant belief system. How is alcoholic a part of that? Well, alcoholic and the archetypal alcoholic that we have in our brain that has been drilled in there by society is the smelly, pissy tramp whose life has fallen apart, who's had a divorce, lost their kids, lost their job, um, it just looks disheveled, it probably lost their home. That is our view of what an alcoholic is. Now, if we always tell ourselves that, hey, as long as I don't look like that or behave like that, okay, then that means I'm a moderate drinker. That means I've got control. That means I can continue to drink. Then for me... That is part of alcoholism is an invisible, violent, and dominant belief system. That version of the alcoholic, it's a scapegoat. It's what resistance uses to allow you to continue drinking. And when you live in a place like Ogmore Valley, I don't know the numbers of on this, obviously, but looking around me, my experience of living there in my life, I would say, I don't like to use the term alcoholic. I prefer alcohol spectrum. And everybody who drinks alcohol is on that spectrum. And and the, the spectrum is not um, a straight line. It's uh, it's like a ski slope, okay? So you've got the, um, like, little uh, Auntie Hilda who drinks, like, one snifter of port a year. She's at the top of the alcoholic spectrum, at the top of the ski slope, all right? And then down at the bottom of the ski slope, you've got uh, Fred who's, you know, lost his family, lost his job. Everybody would call him the stereotypical alcoholic, right? And then we're all on that slope somewhere. 
And the more that we drink and the more out of control we get, the further we get towards Fred. And the less that we drink, the more likely we are to be up towards Hilda. Okay. And in Ogmovale, the amount of people, the amount that people drink means that most people on that spectrum are closer to Fred than they are to Hilda. Okay. However, they still believe that they're drinking moderately. When I first stopped drinking alcohol back in 2009, I would do my podcast like this and I took what I felt at the time as a very courageous step of saying I am an alcoholic. I, I, I used the term, I was going to write a book called The Invisible Alcoholics. There you are, someone can steal it. The Invisible Alcoholics. Because I felt, looking around me in Ogmore Vale, that there were so many people who were alcoholics yet didn't even know they were alcoholics and the culture and the institutions that surrounded them and supported them wouldn't have even bracketed them as an alcoholic. That's why I called them the invisible alcoholics. Um, so I thought I would do is a very brave thing and, and out myself as an alcoholic. So then other people would then say, fuck, if uh, Lee's an alcoholic, then I must be because I drink the same amount as him or more. Um, that actually it didn't happen. Uh, what happened was the cognitive dissonance kicked in within my sphere of influence and people started to say, and I bet you've heard this before, Lee, you haven't got a problem. Lee, you're not alcoholic. Lee, there's nothing wrong with you. Lee, your drinking is fine. Okay? Your drink. Yes, you could be a dickhead sometimes when you've had too much, but we like it when you drink. You're really fun. All that is, is confirmation from the person saying it that they can continue drinking. It's like when I open up and say I've got a problem, then the people around me who don't believe they're a problem, all of a sudden the cognitive dissonance starts to sneak in and they start to ask themselves, well, have I got a problem? Well, of course, alcohol, the addiction, alcoholism, the invisible, violent and dominant belief system, it doesn't want you asking if it's a problem. The addiction doesn't want you questioning its power. So it quickly shuts it off by saying, no, that guy got, hasn't got a problem. OK, and this is why when you stop drinking alcohol, and you turn to those closest to you to support you in the hour of need, unless you've really sat them down and outlined how you want to be supported, one of the first things they'll do is try to get you to drink again. You will think that that's terrible, that they've got, you know, they're trying to stab you in the back, when in reality, all they're doing is trying to help you because they don't want you feeling like you've got a problem, uh, whilst very subconsciously, selfishly helping themselves uh, by removing the cognitive dissonance that's creeping in due to your coming out, okay? Went off the tracks a little bit there, didn't I, okay? So what I'm saying is, uh, can you drink moderately? It's a fucking stupid statement. That's what I'm saying. It's a stupid statement because you can't measure it. Because everywhere, wherever you grow up, the, the, the version of moderation will be very different, okay? But I'll answer your question in terms of how you probably feel that it should be answered, right? And I'll answer it by saying, why? Yes, and why? So yes, you can drink moderately. We know there are people that do it. Yeah, we know people. Uh, oh, yeah, my wife, Liza, she could drink moderately. Uh, let me think. There you are. I can't even remember the last time she had a drink. And when you live with me, I remember when you have a drink, right? So that is someone who obviously can drink moderately. Okay, so yeah, you can do it. But Why? Why would you want to drink a powerful poison, one of the top five most addictive drugs in the world, that kills 3.3 million people a year, that is the causal factor in over 200 illnesses and diseases, which dumbs you down, which makes you fucking stupid, which destroys your insides, which fucks with your mind, which turns you into somebody you are not, which allows you to run away from your problems, which drives a stake in between your relationships, why would you want to drink that moderately? And here's the thing with the truth about alcohol and why we are against um, this. Like, what I mean what I mean to say is there, are, there have never been as many opportunities or outlets Websites, podcasts, training courses, mentors to help you become someone who doesn't drink alcohol than there is today, ever in the history of the world, thanks to the internet. All right. 
and you will find people that they will embrace drinking moderately. Hello Sunday morning, I think, doesn't lead with, hey, let's stop drinking permanently. It's, hey, let's have a, let's have a better relationship with alcohol. And I've told, I've spoke about this before in the marketing of all these people. Alan Carr did it with the easy way to control alcohol. Um, Annie Grace did it with um, uh, her book, uh, This Naked Mind, How to Control Alcohol. This, this, the reason the marketing and the branding is like that is because they know the holy grail for everybody is they want to moderate. Nobody wants to stop drinking alcohol. Nobody. They, they, they want to moderate. And this is why this question is asked so frequently. Can I drink moderately? Please, please, please tell me I can because I don't want to stop. Okay. We are not like that at the Truth About Alcohol. Strivers don't think that. It's not part of our manifesto. It's not who we are. It's not in our DNA. And I'll tell you why, right? And I've, and I've, and I've probably preached to the choir and said this before, but you know I like repetition. I think it's really important. It's the people who drink moderately that the resistance will convince my children to use as role models. So the people who drink moderately, my kids will look at them and think, well, they ain't that bad. They can drink moderately. I can do that. My own son said to me, Dad, I am going to drink when I'm older, but I want you to know if it becomes a problem like it was for you, I'll just quit. Yeah, I'll just quit. Like he's turning off a video game. Completely unaware, completely unaware that alcohol will or has the likelihood or the propensity to fuck you up. Not everybody, obviously, because we know that some people, quote unquote, drink moderately. But why are we going to take that chance? Why do we want to drink a powerful poison that offers you no value moderately? Why do you want to do that? Okay. And really, when you go into it and you start to understand and ask the questions, why am I even drinking this stuff? And you realize that there are no long term benefits of drinking it then a lot of questions come up that you need to answer. Now, for me, I realized that the only reason I was drinking alcohol because I was too much of a scaredy cat, I was too much of a chicken to turn around and say to my quote-unquote mates that I didn't want to drink alcohol anymore. I didn't want them to ridicule me. I didn't want them to call me names. I didn't want them to throw sticks and stones at them at me. I didn't want to feel like I was uncool. I didn't want my status to drop. I wanted to be the cool kid and the leader. And to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol, that wasn't going to happen. Okay? Super important. Super important that we understand why we're drinking. Super important. At the truth about alcohol, during the taster, and more... More, you know, with more emphasis in the intensive, we learn that alcoholism is a visible, violent, dominant belief system. We learn that alcohol has no value. And when we put those two together with the 100 plus coaching videos, with the peer group learning that we're doing together, with all the experience of the people who no longer drink alcohol, who've been through that process, with all that combined into that kind of power that we have, okay? We learn to be people that don't drink alcohol and we don't crave it anymore. And because we don't crave it anymore, the question, can I drink moderately, becomes as insane as saying, can I drink Domestos moderately? Can I drink bleach moderately? Can I drink Listerine moderately? Can I drink my own piss moderately? All of those statements, for me, are no more ridiculous than someone suggesting to me that I could drink alcohol moderately. Why the fuck would I want to drink a, a drug that is so destructive moderately when it doesn't provide me any value? If I know when I go out with my friends, okay, if I know when I go out with my friends that I used to drink because I thought it made me funny or it made the whole atmosphere um, much more 
much better, much more entertaining. But now I realize because I've asked those questions and I'm in the right place at Strive and I've asked those questions and I've said to myself, well, did alcohol really improve my situation when I was in a pub? And then I realized, well, no, not really. It didn't, did it? Playing poker was entertaining. Talking to my mates and having a laugh was entertaining. Um, staring at uh, members of the opposite sex was entertaining. Watching football was entertaining. Listening to the jukebox was entertaining. Dancing was entertaining. Doing the crossword or doing the quiz was entertaining. Playing pool was entertaining, right? But drinking a liquid wasn't entertaining. And the contents of which... Once I had consumed them, would have made me fucking stupid, would have affected all of my senses. So all of those things that I told you that would entertain me, would have entertained me less as a result of the liquid that I was imbibing. And that's not even before I go there and say that we worked so fucking hard all week in a job that we hated. Look, Gallup did a poll in America some while back. Asking people how much they love their job. And over 80% of people couldn't give a shit about their job. Yeah, couldn't give a shit about it. Yet we spend so much of our time, 80,000 hours, yeah, more than anything other than sleep, right? Really up there with sleep. We spend more time in, in work, quote unquote, in our job that we hate. And what do we do with the money that we earn in that job that we hate, that takes us away from the things that we love before we die, what do we spend our money on? We spend it on a, on a drug that does nothing for us whatsoever apart from give off the perceived value that it's actually providing us with any kind of buzz, uh, that it's um, entertaining, that it's relieving our stress. It does nothing for us. Okay, nothing. So Felix, you're in the right place, nearly. You need to migrate from the email list and a podcast to the Strive movement. You need to get involved in the January taster. After you've done the January taster, get yourself involved in the intensive. Immerse yourself with people who do not drink alcohol. And then, and only then, Come again to me and say, Lee, can you drink moderately? And I'll flip the question back to you and you can answer it. And I'm pretty sure you'll turn around and say to me, Lee, it's a pretty dumb question. It's a pretty dumb question. But you're never going to get there until you really, truly understand the philosophy around the truth about alcoholism. And that is that alcoholism is an invisible, violent, dominant belief system. And it provides you with fucking big fat bagel of value long term okay thanks for your question if anybody else has got any questions just email me at truthaboutalcohol at gmail.com and i'll talk about them on the podcast take care for now bye bye bye